Oh. Cheers, and welcome to our fireside chat on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Today we have a special guest on our show, Dr. Brian Harward, a social psychologist. And then I also have John and Pat. We're going to be discussing the psychology of freedom today. Uh, first of all, though, the beer I'm drinking is Chronic by Pizza Port. It's an amber ale. Pretty good. Uh, I'm more of a fan of IPAs, so this isn't quite as hoppy as I like, but it's still really good. Anybody else drinking something? I'm drinking Hill Garden. probably know what that is. If you don't, try it. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. That's my analysis of it. My fermented product of choice for the evening is uh, kombucha. Gingerberry from from Synergy. Nice. So, Brian, is freedom psychologically beneficial, do you think? <laughs> I, I can't imagine disagreeing with that. I think it, it absolutely is, and, and always or almost always. Um, I'm not sure that everyone in mainstream psychology would say that because I interact with them and somehow they find uh -huh. a way to support violence and statism and things. Um, but speaking for myself, I'm unable to see it any other way. Uh, even when you consider different schools of psychology, still it tends to fit. Uh, you know, humanistic psychology fits perfectly in sort of self-determination is a key for, for happiness and um, just being given the opportunity to flourish, which means not being held back by, you know, say the rules or uh, by force from others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want to focus more on uh, poor childhood events, which a lot of people do, um, it's a bit of an older school thing, but guess what? Uh, good parenting practices don't create a lot of those problems. <laughs> um, giving your children freedom, uh, that's not, it's not just that simple, but certainly avoids a lot of the problems. Uh, you know, and just to throw out one more, you know, Gestalt thinking uh, acknowledges that, you know, someone's subjective reality sort of can be accepted as fact to say, well, however you experience it, we accept that you experience it that way. And we have no desire to force you into another way of thinking about it. And that's, again, very accepting, very free. And that's considered healthy um, or, or at least beneficial in that, that mindset. So to me, across the board, it would be wonderful for people's health to have more freedom without really any limitation. Um, in other words, I think the more freedom, the better people would, would do. Um, and we know that people are just happier when they are not bound by the rules of others. Free to be themselves, free to make their own decisions. Um, I think most people acknowledge that, but then at some point retract and say, well, but we can't have total freedom because right. of you know the typical objections um, that, that we might not have enough <clears throat> order or rules um but i would say so you know, often they from an individual about, level it's always good yeah from a societal level i see the argument for saying it's not always good although i think it is yeah sorry what were you gonna say uh i was just gonna say that uh a lot of times they'll probably they'll talk in well uh, in in levels of freedom well how much freedom is too much freedom and and that kind of thing i think yeah, there's there's yeah. many aspects of it, you know. It's like uh, philosophically, economically, uh, you could essentially be enslaved by your ego, or time, or money, or other mm -hmm. factors that that could, uh, you know, effectively shackle you, you know, or shackle your mind psychologically. And uh, it, it's it, it's interesting to see. Uh, I, I mean, personally, uh, the journey and and. and how you could, me personally maybe have, uh, as my understanding of freedom grows and it spills over in other concepts like or other aspects like I just mentioned, uh, it has an e effect on on my personal well-being, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty broad subject. Do you need to go? I may have to run. <laughs> <laughs> We had a minor collision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, 
So to continue what we we're saying, you know, I think another objection is that, that people just have a lot of fear driven problems, you know, right, right, which right. is a theme we talk about a lot. Absolutely. And so they makes sense. They see the, sort of the benefit in a basic way, but then say, oh, but what will really happen? Right. Exactly. Can we truly well do said, this? Right. There's a fear of the negatives that will accompany it. Um, not not always mis misguided either. I mean, if, if you had a three year old and you gave them total freedom. Well, <laughs> I see the problems. Um, but with adults, uh, I, I don't see an end to the benefits, really. And it seems like the negatives are easy to overcome. Yeah, one, one thing I've really learned over my reading and, and delving into the various aspects of freedom is that it's not just a political philosophy. It really has to be a a whole world view, really. Uh, before you to be really actually free mentally. Because statism has permeated pretty much... Or the ideas of, of author, authority, authoritarian memes have permeated pretty much our entire lives. Uh, we can't buy clothes that aren't regulated by the government. We can't drink water that's not pumped by the government. Uh, in a lot of places, it's even illegal to collect rainwater because it's because the government holds claim over it. And and even in even in parenting, I know you're a little bit into the peaceful parenting type stuff. Uh, even in how we raise our kids, can be very controlling even the way we talk to people uh, the our even our language is is ten, tends towards this idea of of authority over us which i think all plays into our mental uh slavery in essence would you agree yeah, I think once it's in the culture, you sort of inherit it as normal. And even worse, you usually end up participating in it before you understand what you're doing. Right. And once you've participated in it, it's even harder to break free. And you, you know, because you'd have to accept that, you, that you've made a mistake or that things you've done in the past right. were not good. And, you know, by the time most people are adolescents, they've, they've aggressed against others in a number of ways, often because they were told to, essentially, or or told to be the obedient one, you know, um, in, in an un, unreasonable situation. And um, something in our mind says, you know, I don't want to think I live in a world that's, that's crazy, chaotic, or wrong, or the things that I've done are wrong. So having done that sort of undermines your ability to see maybe that it's wrong to eliminate another person's freedom or that, that you have a right to retain your own freedom. Uh, because most people that I know have participated in that on both ends of the spectrum, controlling others, being controlled, and accepted as normal, and have even been told a list of reasons of why it's good. You know, maintaining order, maintaining peace. Um, you know, we'll have chaos if everyone doesn't follow the rules. There's no evidence for that, mm -hmm. necessarily. Well, I guess we haven't really tried it. There's no evidence against it either. Uh, but they believe it because it's the common belief, and and that justifies doing it. And, the more and you it's do a it, the fearful more idea. Yeah. If I'm not, if people aren't controlled, then they'll just go wild and start killing people and <laughs> and raping dogs and <laughs> cats and dogs will be living together. <laughs> yeah, there is that sort of fear, even though an individual would tell you they wouldn't do those things even if given the choice, you know. Yeah. Um, but but they feel like everyone else will will do it, um, or maybe they even fear that they would, but I don't think usually. Now the one, the one semi uh, psychological argument that I get often is that while we're we're evolutionarily uh, a pack type social creature, and there are natural these natural leaders or alpha males who will naturally rise to the top to control everyone else and that's just the natural order of things and so we shouldn't fight statism because it's just natural. I would agree totally. It's it's a it's a 
built-in thing that we do very naturally, but that doesn't make it any less terrible. We are naturally built to do pretty awful things. We have aggression <laughs> as one of our primary primary uh, instincts. It's not that it's unnatural. It's that it's bad. It's wrong. Um, so sure, yeah, I agree with them that it's it's hardwired into us to some extent to repeatedly make those mistakes. But that doesn't make them, you know, correct <laughs> things rather than mistakes. I'm going to aggressively interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> this. And having a discussion, evolutionarily speaking, you can have a leader without necessarily having uh, uh, authority built into that. You know, I mean, uh, there will likely always be those who uh, are more inclined to lead, be the first one in, in to embrace new technologies, new ideas, the first ones to... to uh, uh, you know, take hold, take a hold of, of new ideas, or, or basically just lead the way in, in certain aspects. And there will always, always be those who are more inclined to to not blaze trails, for instance. So you can have leadership mm -hmm. without have to, having to have you know the. the you know, someone in blue with a badge and a gun <laughs> on the belt. <laughs> yeah. But, um. but would you say then that statism is is inevitable because of this? No, I think we can get past it evolutionarily speaking. I think we can uh, evolve past the need for the state to manage those complex social issues. You know, we can, we can, I believe that voluntary, we can find a way to manage Water, air, property, crime, uh, roads. Yeah, <laughs> of course, the roads voluntarily. But yeah, I think uh, I think that is the great work. The the noble uh, endeavor is 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 engaging in these conversations and and, and trying to uh, blaze a path forward, the voluntary path. You know? Patrick, I don't know if you exactly know what we're talking about. Basically, I'm a we're just we're Lost, discussing. I'm finding my footing. <laughs> we're discussing right now it's the the existence of natural leaders amongst the species makes statism inevitable. I I have to say I agree with that, but it, it, uh, you were talking about overcoming that evolutionarily right. speaking, and um, I don't know. My view of it is maybe too simplistic in that I just think that it's like another step along the way for us you know i mean obviously some species evolve when challenged and some don't you know right. so i i don't know i i just look at it on that simplistic level like it's evolve from it or perish you know right so uh everything we were capable of doing because of it advanced the species um for better or for worse you know the question is what do you do with it now yeah, I've said it before, I really think that it's a race to either move past statism or go extinct as a species. Like, which one will happen first? Right. I'm, I tend towards optimism. I think we will have freedom, uh, a, a, a worldwide freedom at some point in history. Uh, but really, but there's always that chance that we, that, that the state kills off humanity, I think. Yeah, Stefan Molyneux has that saying, basically, this is 6,000 years of scar tissue on the yeah. mind, you know, that, that we have this compulsion to organize uh, the way we do, you know, the, uh, from the status perspective. But, you know, all we need is an example to further the evolution. And just to clarify, we're talking a social evolution, really. Right, yeah. right. right. Yeah. Um, but if you think about it, the path we've already followed, even though we get down on statism in general, it has been a positive progression throughout the history of leadership, Absolutely. so to speak. Overall, I think. Less deaths, more freedom. You know, the Greek states, the Roman states, the Magna Carta. The from, from monarchy to, to uh, democracy... Uh, or republics, you know, whatever. Um, it it was an improvement in um, prosperity and freedom. 
not total freedom, but it is more. There was more respect for the individual. And I think what really happened, if you look, look back at it just in the most simplistic terms, is someone proved it worked first and everyone copied. And so mm -hmm. that's what we need now. And people ask me all the time, you know, they think it's crazy, especially to, to be well-educated and all this, you know, they say, well, how, you're, how are you an anarchist? You know, do you want to overthrow the government? No, I want the people to want to not ha to have a government, to yeah. realize that we don't want it anymore. Right. And then I want there to not be one. Um, I don't want to force it on anyone, <laughs> to, to right. force the removal of it on anyone. That would be the opposite of what we want. But I think if we can show it's another increase, another level of prosperity and quality of life, like every other major change we've made has been, people will figure it out. And I think it's the natural progression. I don't even think, you know, we should feel too bad about that we've been through what we've been through because, you know, we are primitive in our thinking sometimes. We have a lot of instincts. People do a lot of dangerous things. I think, you know, it took some time to realize there were definitely people saying at one point in time, the masses could never govern themselves. They're too stupid. Well, we've proved people can. It's not going great all the time, but they can, <laughs> right? And we're now saying we don't need anyone to govern us. And people say that'll never work. People aren't smart enough or nice enough or thoughtful enough to do that. Well, they can be. They can be, especially if they see the benefit. You know, um, I, th I think it's where we're headed. Um, hopefully. I'm not as optimistic as you, but um, I think it will happen. I wouldn't guess in our lifetimes, but I hope. There's a few experiments that stand out in terms of uh, authority. Uh, the Milgram experiments, most notably, what, what, what can you say about those? <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're a great example of the, like the sort of the mantra of, of tyranny, the, you know, I'm just following orders, right? They're a great demonstration of that. Uh, in the Why don't study. you explain what, what they were first? Yeah, yeah, so in the Milgram study, uh, people were brought in as participants, and they were fooled to some extent about what was going on. Um, they were told that they were controlling a machine that would deliver electric shocks to a person in an adjacent room, a person who they couldn't see. And that person was attempting to learn something. And word when pairs. what yeah, word pairs. Yeah, it was it was it was yeah, like a word task. And when they answered wrong, they were supposed to receive a shock. And so the people participating in the study were told hey, the idea here is to see if we can improve learning by giving a shock when people get something wrong. Um, the truth of the study was that, that the, the learner, as they called it, the person potentially being shocked and answering questions, was a friend of the researcher and, um, and an actor, and not actually a participant in the study, but a part of the research team. And another researcher would be there, usually in a white lab coat or something like that, somehow looking official, and would also tell them you know, that they need to carry out the study. Um, and what would happen is as it progressed, the shocks get stronger and stronger. The machine was even labeled with, uh, with double or triple X, I think triple X, yeah, triple X on the last one. Um, and somewhere along the line towards the highest level of shock, it said like danger or something. And um, what happened was they basically wanted to see how far would people go um, how much shock would they administer, even the one at the end that maybe could be hurting or killing someone. And uh, as part of this, it's important to say the actor who was supposedly receiving the shocks would, would scream out in pain in the medium levels of shocks and high levels of shocks, um, and even complain of things like uh, that it was causing them trouble with their heart and, and begging for the study to stop. Things like this would happen. Um, I'm not sure if begging for the study to stop was in the original version, but definitely crying out in pain and even complaining about ailments. And the idea was at first, well, people would do this to a point, but they're not sadists, so they'll stop at some point. They wouldn't, they wouldn't torture another right. person. The actual results were the vast majority of people were willing to push the highest level of shock. And uh, the, end, the end result in interpretation was that they did so because they felt they weren't making the choice that the experimenter and the situation was what it was, and they were simply playing a role. And so it wasn't a personal ethical or moral question of pressing the button. It was just following orders. Um, so they thought, well, the experimenter was taking responsibility for it, even though I'm pressing the button to hurt someone. And, uh, you know, they considered that obedience research because they really think the key was that the people did it because they were ordered to. 
And a lot of people protested. They would say, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't hurt somebody like this. And the, the researcher would just say, no, please continue. Um, and they would ensure them that they were taking responsibility for it, just like someone's boss would or someone's uh, uh, superior in the military would, um, saying, no, 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 you're just following orders, just do what I'm saying. And so most people did. Um, did I cover it okay? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, wasn't there a point where they brought in multiple people? Um, and if one person didn't do it, refused to do it, then the rest of the group would refuse as well? Um, not in the like original, that. original version. I don't know if they did that in this study, to be honest. I'd have to, to check again. But, yeah, in some studies, when one person does object, and more people do, yeah. everyone realizing that's what's right will jump ship, so you sort of need that one hero. Um, if you're interested in that type of research at all, look up Philip, Philip, Zimbar Philip Zimbardo. Um, he likes to talk a lot about the nature of evil, and I don't know anyone better to talk about it than him, uh, about uh, not only why we're evil, but in what situations you can change that and be what he calls a hero, which usually involves just not doing something <laughs> terrible. Um, uh, uh, I don't believe he's politically aligned with us, but his explanation of these things and his research is amazing, so look him up, uh, Philip Zimbardo, uh, if you want to learn more about evil <laughs> and why people are evil. <laughs> and, and he's very optimistic, actually, so he talks about how to avoid it as well. There's another one, The Wave, too. High school, 1968, I believe it is, high school civics teacher. Uh, did an experiment on the whole on his whole class essentially, and and it didn't go well in, in the sense that it, it didn't it didn't uh, uh, basically the students had a went down the path that would show that a Holocaust scenario could happen here in the United States yeah. again as late as 1968. You know so. That was the, one of the big inspirations for the Milgram study was to see if right. if people would follow orders like that elsewhere outside of Nazi Germany. and Yeah, <laughs> they will. Just about <laughs> any, any culture. Are you familiar with Marshall Rosenberg at yeah. all? Yeah. He wrote the book uh, uh, Nonviolent Communication mm -hmm. and does or did uh, uh, meetings on it and stuff like that. Um he said that uh, one, one of the things I heard him talking about was during the uh, during the trials on the the Nazis after World War II that somebody asked uh, was it Heinrich Heim Himmler? Himmler. 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 Himmler asked him if it was hard if it was difficult for him to send all these Jews to to their death and he said no it was really easy because of our language and I forget what he called the language it's some German word Amsprache. that's it yeah. Amsprache. and and basically it was a way of de deferring deferring uh, responsibility the whole I'm just following orders type yeah type scenario like you've got in the Milgram experiment and so like I was saying before, I really think it you you have to change your language, how you're talking nice to <laughs> to really understand what's going on. Yeah. Because saying I'm just following orders successfully for a person, at least psychologically speaking, takes away that process of is this or is this not moral? Right. They stop asking that question and and say, well, that's that's not doesn't matter. I'm following orders. And if it was more about them somehow, they would they would stop. We know that. Yeah, the Nuremberg trials proved, at least in a legal sense here in the United States, you know, that it set the precedent that following orders is not is not just. You know, it's not it's not an excuse to to uh, commit heinous crimes. You can't commit heinous crimes and say, hey, I was following orders. But then you kind of look today and it's like that's almost the culture we yeah. see uh, in the emerging police state it's like we've forgotten all about the Nuremberg trials you know anyway I've never seen it more than in becoming a parent and how I talk to my kids because <laughs> uh, yeah I, I'm consistently having to check myself for going into like the old 
paradigm Absolutely, of right, control, yeah. power, authority, threats. Um, I mean, the threats of violence, like that right. was, you know, um, I think my dad, you know, he, who raised me, he was like the first generation of his family to successfully only use the threat of violence and never actually <laughs> have to take it to violence. But I mean, that was still pretty effective in conditioning me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely, I don't know, I'm new to a lot of these ideas and um, I feel like boxer on the way to the glue factory a little bit, you know, <laughs> like snapped up. Wait, wait a minute. I thought I was going to a party. <laughs> this isn't a party. Oh. Yeah, and, and those milligram experiments, when I, um, I uh, learned of those, I was like, crap, I'm in that large percentage of people <laughs> that just follows orders and follows the rules and I don't know knowing that about myself makes me see what I don't want to impart to my children and yeah I don't know that's why I think you're right it'll take a while but it is possible to have this free I concur free I state think. to go back to Marshall Rosenberg along that same lines he just he I heard him telling a story about uh, when he was raising his own son at one point, he, he had asked him, like, to pick up his jacket or something, and his son said, who was your slave before I was born? <laughs> and he said it just, it just hit home for him. <laughs> That's funny. Exactly what, wow. he was, what he was doing, that, that the language he was using was sounding like a command rather than yeah. a request. Kids say the darndest things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, another study, the Stanford Prison Study. My understanding, it wasn't even finished no, because of... That was Philip Zimbardo. He ran that study. Um, and uh, it was Man. called off early because it got so out of control so quickly. Um, interestingly, Dr. Zimbardo himself didn't realize it because he was playing warden. He got so hmm. wrapped up in it, his research assistant had to actually convince him to stop it because he had also you know being such a smart guy running the study on purpose still got caught up in it to where he didn't realize it needed to be stopped uh, she convinced him to stop it so they did i believe it was just four days in yeah right, um, and it was planned to go quite a bit longer um but things got so out of control there they set up a mock prison um and uh, people who participated all knew they were going to be put in this sort of setting they agreed to be in a similar setting but they, they came in either to be um, guards um, or prisoners. The prisoners were actually arrested realistically, like at home or wherever. Um, but they, they knew still that it was fake because they were told they were going to participate in this experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but they were often still humiliated, you know, you know, being handcuffed on their, on their street or something like that in front of the neighbors. Um, and, and then within that, what happened just to shorten things is very quickly the guards became uh, extremely abusive and the prisoners became very difficult and trying to um, understandably uh, go against what the guards were doing, doing hunger strikes and uh, things like that and um, it got abusive really, really quick. Uh, that's not what they expected. They might have expected that behavior, sort of, um, but uh, at least one person had a, like a mental breakdown, as they call it, just completely lost it. Um, and he knew it was fake. Everyone knew it was fake. No one was being fooled here. It just felt so real. Uh, they even invented their own beliefs about what was going on. They were all free to leave, but somehow the prisoners, like a rumor started, and they believed they weren't really free to leave. Uh, things like that happened. And mm. The things the prisoners were subjected to was the most shocking. They were degraded, like physically, um, made to do humiliating things, as well as just abused you know, physically. Um, and so it was another one of those sort of scary look into human nature sort of studies. I, I remember taking away from that, tying it into it, like uh, slavery, that even some of the role, some of the, the students involved in the experiment uh, uh, get aggressive towards their fellow experimenters the the, the the inmate experimenters um uh because they took it the ones who were who were uh speaking out were um 
were um, chastised. Right? Yeah, chastised basically. And you find out in slavery, in the antebellum slavery too, that uh, they, they were stealing away of the labor pool basically, and that uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and, and unfortunately we weren't able to get to robot sex again this week. But uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I didn't see that time. But uh, <laughs> yep, time's up. Uh, have a good evening. Take care. All right.